Welcome, everybody, to our amazing podcast. Today, we have an amazing guest. We have Mr. David Metzger. What's up, David? How you doing? Tell us about yourself, buddy. Hey, Peter. Hey, Matt. Um, so good to be here with you both. Um, my name is David Metzger. Um, I am also a podcaster, host of the Nurse Papa podcast, and the author of an upcoming book about my experiences as a father and a pediatric oncology nurse. Um, and like, a, like I just said, I'm a pediatric oncology nurse um, based in the Bay Area. Have you done pediatric oncology your, your whole career? First job. I've been there for 13 years and, and have not moved on. Damn. Same, same hospital as well? Or have you switched like hospitals? Same. Well, we built a new hospital, but um, if we had not, it would have been the same hospital. I have, I've had the one job my entire nursing career, which is very different from you, you fellas. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about like oncology nurses or pediatric nurses specifically, like how it is working <clears throat> with kids, for example, because we never had that, you know, that patient population. Yeah, I mean, I've never worked with an adult patient. Um, well, actually, I take that back and we'll get into that. It's a really interesting thing that most people don't know about pediatric oncology. Mm. Um, yeah, I take care of kids with cancer and that's primarily leukemia, solid tumors, osteosarcoma, um, you know, neuroblastomas and then blood disorders, you know, kids with hemophilia, sickle cell and tons of like rare genetic disorders. Mm. Um, and then my unit is broken up into two different units. One is oncology where we treat some of the more basic cancers. And then there's the bone marrow transplant where we treat those kids who are so intractable to their diseases that there's no way we can cure them with oncological treatments. They have to get a a bone marrow transplant, um, which is a really intense um, procedure to go through and super dangerous, but um, you know, we do a really good, good job of it. So with bone marrow transplant, they, uh, if I'm, I haven't looked this up recently, but they take like a basic needle and they, dig into your bone and aspirate the bone marrow inside your bone, correct? Is that how it works? Um, that is traditionally how it's been done, but okay. it's not necessarily the way it's done now. Mm-hmm. Um, we do something called phoresis, which is basically um, patients get an IJ, or not the patients, um, often the donor gets an IJ, um, and then their cells are basically taken from, you know, in that method. It, mm-hmm. There are times when people actually get poked into their um, actual bone marrow, and that's the way they get it, but I think that is... A little bit older style, and it's not not usually what happens. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I would Jeez. I would think that you know by now they'd find like a better system in place. I just have never worked with pediatric oncology, so I wasn't sure how that works. But that's that's good. So every every single owner or donor, I should say, that is going to donate has to get a right to IJ or like a central line, basically, in order to donate like the um the bone marrow. Often, not uh-huh. not always the way it happens. Sometimes you can actually do it with a a peripheral. It's it's you know it depends on what kind of cells they're going to do. And you know what um, the disease that they're treating—that's not part of the process that I'm usually involved in. You know, mm-hmm. the cells come to us in this magic little cooler, like yeah. <laughs> um, that comes up to the floor when it's time to give the transplant. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a relatively unexciting procedure. It's like giving blood, except you know your patient can have a serious anaphylactic reaction to it. Oh, wow. right. And it's Which, kind of is, is it similar to like getting blood, where you got to do like the cross match. Of course, they have to have the same blood type and all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's why it's so hard to find a donor, right? I mean, depending on your particular genetics or your particular background. And, you know, if you're a mixed race person, it can be really hard to find a donor because, you know, there's not that many people out there like you and they have to do really big search and searches for that. You know, for that reason, a lot of these patients end up getting haplos, which are basically cells from their parents. You know, so each parent has half of the genetic material that um, each child has. So you're basically going into a transplant with with material that doesn't necessarily match with what you have, which brings its own risk, you know, to the bone marrow transplant, because you um, can have something called GVHG, which is graft versus host disease, which um, is when the actual graft, the cells that you get from your parents fight against your actual cells. So it can be really nasty, really dangerous. There's so many things that go into it. It's super complicated. Wow. So like when you're taking care of these pediatric kids, do you think they're aware of everything that's happening? Do you think they're aware that they have cancer? Yeah. Kids are so smart. (laughs) Um, And it's funny. I think one thing that you guys probably don't know, because why would you, is that, you know, people think that I treat kids who are from, you know, the ages zero to 18, but that's just not the case. I mean, I've treated people who are as old as 30 years old. I've treated people who have kids. And the reason that we take care of these people as well is because for two reasons. First, somebody may have leukemia when they're 15. We treat it. It goes away. It comes back when they're 19. 
we treat it, it goes away. It comes back when they're 22, they're actually adults, mm -hmm. but we're gonna still treat them. You know, we know them, we know their disease, and this is how we take care of them. So that's one. And then we, we also have patients who are in their 30s, in their 20s, and they develop a leukemia or a sarcoma that is very typical of a disease that kids get. And we don't send those kids to the adult unit or these adults because you know, they don't understand the regimens. They don't know how to treat them. So, you know, I've taken care of, you know, these 20 year olds and 30 year olds, and that's just the way it is. And that's kind of the cool part of being a pediatric nurse, at least where I work, because I get to treat every age group, which is really amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Specifically, though, like, let's just say if they're like less than like eight years old, and they're in like the developmental stage that they're just focused on themselves. For example, if you're taking care of an older patient has cancer, they know that, hey, time is running out, I have this deadline of my, my life expectancy, correct? What about yeah. this like six year old um, boy or girl that has cancer? Are they aware to cognitively, cognitively kind of be like, I'm going to possibly die? I mean, that's a really great question. And I think it depends on the child. I mean, you really get those kids who are super old souls. Like you just know it, they've been, they've been in other lives. I mean, I don't necessarily believe um, in reincarnation, but if I did like there's some kids who I just, they've got so much wisdom and they get what's going on. Um, and then even, you know, the basic kids are, are super aware of what's, what's happening. But to that point, there are many kids who just don't engage with it, whether they understand it or not, they just do their thing. Um, and, you know, they don't kind of talk about the fact that they may die or the fact that, you know, they've, have this disease but what every kid is so aware of is that their life is totally transformed they're out of school they're in the hospital they're sick they're throwing up they're in pain so i mean it's for a child and i think for even an adult patient when you have such immediate physical issues it's hard to focus on the fact that you may die next month because you just feel like crap mm. um so it's just not in the forefront of their existence in that moment but I have seen some kids have such realized, you know, words and thoughts about their diagnoses. And it really depends on the child. There's some special, special kids out there. So how do you like talk to a child like that? How do you approach a kid that is like sad, is down, or is starting to realize that his life is completely different from his peers, from his, from his friends? How do you communicate to a child like that? I mean, you guys don't have kids. No. You will well, someday, I assume. We'll see. If you're lucky, you'll you'll just keep it simple. <laughs> um, but I uh, know having kids is great. But, um, you know, kids engage in a different way than adults, you can't just talk to them, you need to play with them, you need to interact with them. Um, I've had some amazing moments with kids, where we weren't talking about their diagnoses, but we were, I mean, mm -hmm. if you play dolls with your little patients, um, they'll treat them, they'll put band-aids on them, they'll inject them. And they're all kind of filtering this experience of being a sick child through these toys. So for me to like really engage with these younger kids, I don't, I don't bring up the fact that they have cancer because they're aware of that. But it's more about kind of just engaging with them as humans, engaging with them as playful people. And that's how you gain their trust. And that's how you get close to them. So it's, it's a really very situation based thing where I try to read the room. I try to read what the kid is thinking and what they're feeling. And I go from there, but playing and interacting and always asking permission to do things is the way I really like to approach it. Like I don't walk up to a kid and just stick my stethoscope on their back. Like I ask them, like, can I, can I put my stethoscope on your back? Or, you know, if they have a teddy bear there, I'll listen to the teddy bear first, you know, cause that's what they're engaging with. I have like listened to the hearts and lung sounds of so many stuffed animals before I ever put that <laughs> stethoscope on a child, you know, it's just like, you have to be patient and you have to realize that they're in a very traumatic, scary place. I mean, you know, we're nice, you, you're not going to find a mean pediatric oncology nurse, but they don't care that all they know is they're sick, and they're not where they, they're supposed to be, they're not at home. So you have to really get to the space where they're at before you can get them to the space where you need them to be. That's, that's beautiful to me. Uh, during the pandemic, though, so for example, our patient population, the parents or the family weren't able to come in, correct? Um, how did it work with, for example, COVID and everything? Um, was the parent able to come and see the, uh, I'm sorry, the kids still? 
Yeah, man, it's been so hard. I mean, we have it better than most people because we do take care of kids because we can't expect parents to leave their sick children in the hospital. I mean, there's always a parent with a child, almost always. And I have to say, like, I have so much gratitude for the parents of these children because they are so in tune with their kids. You know, they often will let me know about something wrong that's happening before I'm even aware of it because they, they know their kids. You know, our kids can go from looking perfectly fine to like a septic emergency within an hour. You know, it's, it's absolutely nuts to see how fast a child can de decompensate. So I, I depend on these parents. You know, I depend on my own clinical observations and skills, but you know, it's so important to have them there. But uh, these kids and these parents have, have suffered so much because of COVID because they, they don't have the same kind of visitation that they used to. So for, for instance, beforehand, you could always have, um, you know, especially in bone marrow transplant, two parents at the bedside most of the time, sometimes overnight. And then for the first year, nine months of COVID, it was one parent, no siblings, you know, everything was locked down, everybody's wearing a mask, it really transformed their experience. And it was super unfortunate because you have these kids who are living in the hospital for months. I mean, the typical bone marrow transplant that goes well, the kid will probably be in the hospital for two months. That's pretty reasonable. I've had kids in the hospital for a year before because they're so goddamn sick. So when you are limiting their visitors and limiting that kind of comfort care that they can have, it, it means a lot. And we are loosening those things right now because things are getting better as far as our um, as our COVID count right now. So it's getting back to normal, but it's still not there yet. But it was a big deal, real big deal. And like, how do you transition from taking care of like ill patients, ill kids into taking care of and being a father and taking care of healthy kids? It must be such a like a, it's like a culture shock, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, man. It's I mean, the answer to that question is I don't know if I do. I mean, I'll tell you a story. So like, you know, when one of our kids dies in the hospital, we give the kid a bath and that's just the way we, we treat their body. I mean, it's this very ritualized, beautiful moment. I mean, it sucks what's happening. Like they died, we know them really well and we want to, we want to kind of usher them out of this world in a, in a really peaceful, loving way. So we give them a bath and then we transfer them to the morgue. There have been times when I've done that and then I've gone home and given my own kids a bath and, you know, put them to bed and read them a book. And it is such a mind fuck to do that, well, <laughs> you know, one night. Um, but it's also amazing. Like there's, I can't imagine a better way to feel thankful for my healthy child than to have that kind of split dichotomy between home and the hospital. I think that when I was a new nurse, I tried to compartmentalize these two different spaces. And I think it caused me lots of stress and mental pain. And I think naturally, you know, our human brains will separate out the stuff that really sucks. Like, you know, we just won't think about it. So, you know, part of it just happens naturally where I will just kind of leave one zone and, and, and enter the other. But I do think it's really important to be aware of of what we're doing and where we came from. I mean, the world's a beautiful fucking place. It's so awesome, but it's so horrible too. So much happens that, you know, I don't even want to think about, but just because I'm not there to see it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So I want to be there for these kids. And then I want to be there for my kids and just understand that, you know, there's bad stuff out there, but it doesn't mean that the good stuff isn't also really present. It's hard. Um, I'm still working it out. Um, maybe you guys can give me some advice on how to make it through a shift and then go home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can imagine it being super hard for you because Matt and I work in the ICU. So we don't develop that bond as closely as, as, as you do in pediatric oncology, especially because I'm guessing you have uh, patients that come in throughout the year, right? And you, and you, so, so kind of Matt and I work in ICU. So usually it's, we get a patient, we stabilize, and then we don't really see him again. Or, mm -hmm. you know, we bring them in, or we stabilize them, and they, they pass away, and we don't see them again. So I can imagine with pediatric oncology, it's a little different because cancer is like a chronic disease, you could say. So you're going to see that kid more often than, than once, and you're able to develop a different kind of relationship with them, correct? Is that, is, oh, is that how that works? Absolutely. And, you know, 
you're also missing the point that my kids aren't vented and my kids are awake. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're taking care of uptunded patients quite often, I assume, yeah. right? Oh yeah. Almost all the time, but especially with the pandemic, we just basically had all vents. Like we honestly, for like half a year, I didn't talk to my patients for a long <sighs> time. And, and last week was the first time I took, I took care of a patient that was not intubated and the family was there. And it was so weird because <laughs> I, I, I almost felt out of place in my own damn uh, room taking care of a patient because the family was there. It was just so strange to me because we're just so used to taking care of patients and they're on, they're on my time because they're intubated, they're sedated. I'm doing everything in a the, in the routine. And then I forgot what it is when the patient needs something or maybe their stomach is hurting. And now I got to drop everything I'm doing and I have to go, you know, <laughs> take care of that patient with what's the symptoms, you know, that, that, that are going on. Yeah, no, that's wild, man. You know, our, our disciplines of nursing are so different, which is yeah. the great thing about nursing, right? That you can do so many different things. Um, but yeah, I know these kids, some of these kids so well, like I've taken care of some of them for years. I, you know, I've known some of them from the times they were babies and they, you know, have these intractable diseases and they still keep coming back to us. So yeah, I know they're, I know what they like. I know the songs they like. I know, exactly how to give them the, their meds. I know their uncles. I know what their uncle's dog is called. Like, I mean, it is a, it is a real relationship. And I think for me, personality wise, that's my bread and butter. I love it. I love being able to like have that kind of relationship with my patients for other people. I think maybe that's not what they're into. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, I think that's why each nursing discipline attracts different personalities and different types of nurses. Right. Yeah. Is there like a way that, you're able to step away from the hospital environment and kind of recalibrate to like your normal life. Because a lot of nurses in our floors, they, they struggle with, with being really attached to a patient. And I can only imagine with peds, that's probably 10x and, and more. So what are some maybe advice you give to a nurse that loves her job, loves peds psychology, loves her unit, but is like struggling at home because she's bringing that baggage with her and keeps thinking about her patients. Is there anything that you do to kind of relieve that or not to think about your work environment all the time? I mean, yeah, I don't think it's healthy to go home and think about, hey, did I do something wrong with that drip at eight o'clock? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you did, you should call. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, like I said before, I think it is very difficult to separate these two worlds that we live in because, you know, like I said, I'm a caregiver to kids at work and then I'm a caregiver to kids at home. Um, but what can I say? What, what I can say is having balance is so super important. So I tell my, my young nurses who I mentor, like, you need to have something going on outside of work. You need to, you know, take care of your relationships. You need to talk to your friends. You need to read books. You need to get out there and exercise. You need to eat well. You need to have interests. You know, for me in particular, I'm a writer. I'm a musician. I'm an artist. Like, for me, that's how I get my energy back. Um, I love, you know, exercising in nature. I take my paddleboard out into the bay and just like we'll spend hours miles away from anybody that's crying, which is like so necessary for me to be hearing the you know, sounds of the birds and the swish of the waves rather than, you know, the sounds of cars and the screaming of my kids. Um, so I think having space, having balance is so super important. I don't think you're ever going to get away from being a nurse because, you know, <laughs> You could be walking down the street and somebody has a cardiac arrest and you are the person who's going to say, oh, I know how to give CPR. I'm going to start it. Yeah. Um, and I've had that happen so many times um, where some cracked out person has just like, you know, gone, gone blue Stop in front breathing. of me. And I'm like, yeah, you got to be there. It's right. You know, that's what that's what you do as a nurse. You're a nurse all the time. And it's like when I am on the playground with my kids and I see a, see a kid fall down. Well, not during COVID. I don't touch anybody, but, <laughs> but, you know, back before COVID, I would pick that kid up. I'm a nurse on the playground too. So the, the answer to that question is complicated, but you got, you got to have balance. Mm. Have you ever felt the burnout of nursing? Cause oh, I can imagine it because yeah. personally, like adults are, adults are great, but me working with kids would be a lot harder for me because I know I would definitely take some of that baggage home and I know that would burn me out more than adults. So, you know, how, how do you deal with burnout? And if you did feel it, how did you get past it? I think for dealing with burnout is hard. You got to love what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing and you can't put up with the bullshit because there's so much bullshit in hospitals, right? Like oh, yeah. policies that don't make sense. Um, parents that are difficult, kids that are difficult, colleagues that are difficult. So I think if you don't love, really, truly love what you're doing, 
that burnout is going to be super fast and super hard. So I think you need to find the discipline that you love and become a master of it. I mean, you need to be a good nurse. You need to have, you know, a certain amount of autonomy at work. So you have to be an expert and, you know, be able to tell people this is how it's done. And, you know, when you're able to do that, you can kind of be more of a master of your craft. And I feel like there's a lot less burnout when you feel like you've got control. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard. Um, I think for me, coming home and expressing myself with art, with music is super important with dealing with that burnout. Having colleagues who I can talk to is really amazing. I mean, the shit that goes down in the, the nurse lounge, like the things we talk about, it's so dark and, you know, funny. Yeah, the <laughs> dark humor. humor, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, the things that that nurses say, I, would, I wouldn't want parents and patients to hear what we say. Mm. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's how we deal with it, right? I mean, you, we talk about death and we talk about disease and, you know, it has to have a funny light to it. We have mm. to be able to put it in context. Yeah. So, so speak, I want to piggyback off this whole conversation about how to cope with things and the, the double-edged sword that you deal with where you have family and friends, or I'm sorry, family and patients that you're taking care of and you're so close with. And like, for example, we have this, um, this difference where we see patients, uh, what is it called? Smaller like the time. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like there's more, um, turnover in a way there's different patients and he develops this emotional connection. So I've been reading a book meditations by Marcus Aurelius and maybe this could help a lot of nurses that are listening. So I, um, what I wrote down is that death is often characterized as something negative or evil. And like, you know, we imagine this as a green reaper or someone waiting in the corner preparing for us to die. And I think um, on a grand scheme of things in the public, we have like a very bad perception about death. And, you know, I, I think this is what I kind of wrote down that it's unfair to characterize death in this way rather than being good or evil. It's simply natural. It happens to each and one of us in a stage of our life that we should accept just as we embrace its transition from youth to old age. So changing our relationship to the concept of death can help you master your feelings and the way you think of it. So has your, has your concept of death changed? Like being like through your work experience? And oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Matt, I have a question for you. Where were you in 1972? Hmm. 1972, I was probably balls. in the universe somewhere. Um, maybe in my dad's sperm bank or something. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, man. I wasn't alive though. Well, were you sad about that fact that you weren't alive? No, because I didn't know that. Mm. Exactly. You know, I, my relationship to, to death has always has, has changed a lot. I was so afraid of death when I was a kid. I would wake up. I don't even know why I'm talking about this, fellas, but um, I would wake up with a stomachache in the middle of night because I was so afraid of dying. Like I was so acutely aware of my mortality when I was five years old. And I don't know why. Maybe I was a really cerebral kid. I was just kind of aware of that. Maybe we had a pet that died. I mean, I just kind of like knew about it and I was scared. Um, but as I've taken care of so many kids who have died, my relationship to it has for sure changed. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm not afraid of death. I'm still kind of thinking about what it means to me, but I do see it as a natural thing. I mean, everything dies, everything gets old and everything changes. And, um, you know, I'm so thankful for my life right now I mean, I could die this moment. Um, I hope I don't because we're having an interesting talk. But um, <laughs> that be some shit. I would, I would be so grateful for what I've already had because I have seen so many two-year-olds and six-year-olds get only that. And I'm 44, and I've had 44 awesome years. Well, some of them sucked. The the early 30s sucked, um, but the rest of them have been so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I just feel so grateful that I've had that. And I think that people need to understand that, you know, life is a gift. And if you don't take it for what it is, you're always going to be sad. You're always going to yeah. be waiting for what's what comes next. Right. And that's I, a beautiful thing of um, God or the universe, whichever you may is that, you know, things get created from it. And that source is always given back, right? There's always this balance, right? Whatever nature produces, it almost kind of comes back to nature in a way, right? It's the beautiful continuation of life. Mm -hmm. It's just this never ending cycle of creating and destroying in a way. And that's the balance. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I want to be buried under a tree. <laughs> yeah. I, I think a lot of back. people, yeah, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word death, they associate an excruciating amount of pain with it. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why when people say they fear death is, is for that reason, because I think it's associated with a lot of pain. And, you know, I've, I've looked at some theories and some different lectures re regarding death and, you know, what it is and how it works and, you know, is there anything else afterwards? So I came to the conclusion, my personal conclusion that, you know, how there's a, there's a point in your life where you're a baby, you're a child, and you don't know that portion, you don't, you don't remember it. Like between the age of zero to like, I don't know, six or, or five, you, you're completely obsolete to that part of life, right? You don't know what happened between those years. That's kind of how death is too. Like you, you, you're, you don't know about it and you can't really put it in like a picture or, or visualize it is because you're not supposed to like naturally. Same way, you know, when you're a child, when you're coming out of your mom's womb, you don't feel that pain. You don't feel your umbilical cord being being cut, right? There's a reason for that, right? It's like almost like a defense mechanism. Like it's a traumatic part of your life and the most traumatic part of your life. But yeah, it's the it's it's the biggest development phase of your life as well. And that's kind of how, how I view, view as death, as we're never going to understand death. We're never going to experience death until death actually comes. Yeah, no, I, I think you're so right. It's so funny, though. My son, who's four. He always talks about how he remembers being inside my wife's belly. Like, really? I wonder if kids, you know, under a certain age, just kind of are are more in tune with, you know, the time that we're we're not supposed to remember. But you're exactly right. I mean, I've I've listened to lots of palliative care lectures, and you know, the thing that people are most scared of when they're dying is one pain, exactly, and two is this kind of perception of lack of dignity, hmm. as in like they'll shit themselves or they will, you know, not be control of their mental facilities. And um, I think people really are caught up in these things. And when you've seen enough death, as I have, and you guys most certainly have too, you for sure have a different perception of it, right? Than most mm -hmm. people who, you know, they don't, they don't see it. A hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah, of course. I don't take as harshly as other people just because of, of my belief that this, this isn't it. Yeah. You know, so I feel like that has definitely helped me get get past that hump as a new grad nurse, especially in the ICU, where a lot of our patients go septic and they, and they die. And it kind of as a new nurse, maybe like a year in, sometimes you have that series where your patients just, just, just die. And no matter how good of quality care you provide, they, they just end up dying. And what kind of helped me realize that, hey, it, it's OK. What helped me realize that it's okay is a fact that my beliefs change from it being the end to it being the end of this and the future of, of later or whatever you want to, you want to say. And that's definitely helped me through it. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Um, you know, I don't come from a Christian background and I'm not particularly religious now, but I do have spirituality and you can't yeah. take care of people who are that sick and not have some sense of, of connection to the universe. But I do have patients and their families who are so, intensely Christian. And I've seen the comfort that having, you know, direct faith in the afterlife has on the process of dying. And man, it looks nice. I mean, I would love to have that kind of um, feeling of safety about what's going to happen after I pass away, but I don't personally have it. But I do appreciate when people, for whatever reason, you know, this is their faith tradition, are able to, you know, rest on that. And it, it brings a lot of comfort. I mean, say whatever you want about religion being the opiate of the masses. It is an opiate. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's a very good perspective. I, I think it just gives hope, you know, and that's what we need to carry on in life sometimes. Mm. And if you ask me about how I see things, for example, I love stoicism and like philosophy, spirituality, right? I sometimes feel like maybe we don't die because we're this, we are spiritual beings in a human experience, you know, and, and this human body that we're embodied in, is more just like a vessel. You know, it's a vessel to, it's a tool for our spirit to go on to wherever it has to, you know, we don't have that answer. I don't, but it's just interesting to, you know, think about that concept. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of meditations, right? Cause I mentioned that book about death and everything. You wrote a book too. And I was curious, what are your favorite meditations and your, you know, parenting examples from that book? Yeah. No, thanks for asking. Um, so the book doesn't come out till August and it's been a real journey. It took me five years to write and it feels like that much time to find a publisher for it too, but I finally did. Um, but the whole point of the book is, you know, these lessons and meditations I've learned at the bedside with these kids and their families that I've been able to take home and directly apply to my life as a parent, a life, my life as a human. And, you know, they're not really lessons about how to, you know, stop your kid from looking at a tablet or make him eat his vegetables. They're much more about 
being aware of the experience of parenthood. So for instance, there's a chapter um, in the book called Meet Your Kids Where They Are and Not Where You Want Them To Be. I mean, every parent, I feel like, has this impulse to kind of control where their kids are going to go and to help you know, lead them down the path that they decide is a good one for them. And I'm no different. I feel like I've you know, often had this kind of heavy handed you know, way with my kids. But what I've learned in, you know, from these kids in the hospital is that you can't do that and be a really effective parent. Um, so I had this patient and you know, this is a story I tell in this chapter. His name was Alberto, which is not his real name, but we'll call him Al Alberto for now. And he had a disease called DIPG, which is just this horrible brain tumor. There's no good outlook for this tumor. You're going, you're going to die. And not only will you die, you will die in almost an ALS manner in which you are slowly robbed of your facilities. Like this kid, I had taken care of him and he was able to, you know, he was able to talk, he could hear, he could kind of move and take care of himself. He was the beginning of his diagnosis. And then I saw him again, like, you know, a year later, and he was totally transformed. He was mostly blind. He was pretty deaf. He was full care. Um, I mean, he was having seizures. It was just a mess. Like, it was horrible. And I was standing over his, his bed with his mom one day, and he was sleeping. And she was holding his hand and just talking about him, like telling me, you know, about his life before he had his disease. Like, he was an Eagle Scout. Um, he was, you know, super good at math. He was really into cars. And, but then she, she looked at me, and I'll never forget the look on her face. And she said, but I am so proud of, of who my son has become. You know, the grace that he's had in this disease, the patience he's had with us as his parents. And I just realized then, like, that's what being a parent is. It's letting your kids be who, we, who they are when they are that and supporting them and being proud of them. And it's things like, things like that, these kind of like really intense discoveries about what it means to be a parent and what it means to be a child that made me want to write this book because I've seen these things happen and I'm just, people need to see this. They need to know that parenting is this complex dance. It's not even a dance, you're on a tightrope. And on either side, you can do so many things that are gonna fuck up your kid. And the world is going to do so many things that are going to fuck up your kid. And you just got to be there on that tightrope with them. And you both have like that pole that's kind of keeping you, you know, up there on that tightrope. And you're just, you're there together. You're there together. Damn, damn that was beautiful. Yeah, I just got goosebumps. I yeah, same you. here, man. That's I, I think I have and, goosebumps too. And, 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 <laughs> like, and I don't, I don't, I don't know how you myself. do it, man. Like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you could do a uh, pizza college. Like, that's like probably the hardest unit that I could ever think of working on. Yeah, yeah it's it's such a joy. I, I have to tell you, like, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Like, um, I find myself just laughing and just like so joyous as I go between these rooms, you know, that I'm taking care of these patients. Like, I think one thing people don't realize is that life doesn't end in the hospital. These kids are growing, they're learning, they're, you know, they're becoming individuals, even, even if they're dying, they're still kind of being human and, and and growing up and these parents are like starved for conversation you know because they're just like with their kid in a room which let me tell you can be so fucking hard if you have to spend 24 hours for months in a room with your child like i mean i wouldn't want to do that <laughs> yeah. um so there you know there's so much opportunity for deep conversation for laughter for jokes like it is not a burden i i'm actually like ashamed that i get paid to do this like it's such a great job mm. It's wow. a very good perspective that you bring up that they have a life outside of hospital because we don't, we rarely have that perspective in the, in the ICU because oh, yeah. not everybody comes out and it's different because they're the old people under eighties their seventies. They don't come out very often. And I haven't, I don't remember the last time I thought about a patient outside the hospital, to be honest, like their life outside of hospital, like that rarely crossed my mind. Is it something that you want to have or do you really like that kind of separation? I have no idea. I mean, that's all I've had separation in my, my whole nursing career, uh -huh. you know, so I, it would probably bring me more joy um, internally if I could have patients that allow me to think that way. But the amount of stuff that we see in the hospital, because, you know, people would get revert DNR orders reversed, you know, they hop off palliative, they hop off hospice, and then you have to deal with codes. 
I prefer not to think about them outside the hospital. It's point. almost like having a on and off switch, right? Where your experience, you have this experience where we're not numbing it, correct? We're not numbing what we're experiencing. We're feeling it. We're also putting, we're compartmentalizing. We're putting it in a box and we're putting it away for the next shift, right? And then we go live our lives in a way. Like that's yeah. that's that's the way I've created nursing to be because it's, it's very hard to see the stuff that we see, you know? And it's like, even though this patient is older, they live their life, you know, it's not as sad, but it is in a way, you know? And it's, it's just a human experience, right? It's just seeing suffering, no, no matter who it is, like seeing pain and suffering is not a good emotion. And I feel like sometimes it just like, it kind of messes you up a little bit, right? Yeah, like it, it kind of throws your energy off, you get drained, right? Like, like nursing is not only this physical job, it sucks your life force away and you mm-hmm. need to recharge, you know, and that's why, just like you mentioned, you need that life balance where you're, you're an artist, you know, you write a book, you do a podcast, you go bond with nature. You need that creativity. You need that passion outside of nursing to recharge your life force before you could get back at it. Cause it's just more than just nursing and patient care. Cool. Yeah. And I totally, totally agree with you. One thing I would add is that it's okay to feel messed up and fucked up sometimes because that also is part of the human experience. You know, how can you experience joy if you don't experience just feeling completely just flattened by your experience? Like I don't like feeling like that, but I do appreciate that I can tell the difference between feeling like that and feeling really good. Mm -hmm. And we learn from these times, right? We learn from seeing other people suffering and we grow from being there during their suffering like you're right this is a extremely hard job but it's so rewarding mm-hmm. like you need to like kind of recognize that as well you know mm-hmm. yeah and um being you being a male nurse correct like how does your experience change being a pediatric oncology nurse because you know females have this nurturing side to them correct not saying you're not nurturing but i'm sure when it comes to patient care it's a little bit different being a male i've had this you know a different experience being a male nurse as well yeah i mean it's probably it probably depends on on the discipline right um you know one strange thing is i do you know we live in a mis, you know a misogynistic world right i mean some people feel like males are smarter and it's so not the case i mean um so I, there there are moments when i've um had parents trust my expertise more than a female nurse expertise which i think is horrible because there's there's no reason that I'm smarter or a better nurse because I'm a male. But I will say, being a male nurse um, in pediatrics is kind of a rare thing, um, or pediatric oncology specifically. You know, we have 150 nurses and 10 or 15 of them, so 10% maybe are, are males. And it's a really amazing opportunity for teenage boys or other kids who are males to have that male nurse as their nurse because you know we're able to understand where they're coming from they feel open to talking to about it you know about their fears yeah you know, i was once stopped in the hallway by this patient i had didn't i had never met him i didn't know him at all but he immediately drew me into a conversation about like masturbating into a cup because they were trying to bank his sperm you know prior to his chemotherapy and we had this intense conversation this very loving conversation about his experience and and I was able to come to his place. I wasn't able to make it better. I wasn't able to take away his fear and his pain, but I was able to relate to him. And sometimes that's all you need, right? Somebody who can relate to your experience. And um, you know, that's why I've made this podcast, which is the Nurse Papa Co- Podcast, because I really try to talk about these, these stories of parenthood. You know, parenthood is such a crazy experience. Like, you know, God bless you guys if you choose to do it at some at some point in your lives. It's so hard. And I wanted to be really honest about these stories, how wonderful it is, how painful it is, how funny it is. Like kids are so goddamn funny. So yeah. like, I feel like just, you know, being in touch with all these different parts of humanity is really interesting and kind of giving that to people as well. Yeah, I was going to bring our podcast because... I took listen to it last night and it's a little bit different. Like we were talking before the show, it's a little bit different than like your standard podcast. Like you actually go into like the stories you give, you give tips and you answer questions at the end of each show. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah each, uh, each episode has two sections. Mm-hmm. One is a, 
a story of parenthood where I kind of take a deep dive into an experience I've had with my kids. It can be, um, you know, potty training in an episode called Corona, the virus that potty trained my son. Um, or, you know, this recent episode called The Marriage Scrabbled, where I talk about how, you know, communication, um, you know, plays a, and how we communicate, the words we use, you know, plays a big role in how my wife and I kind of interact through the, and it's all told through the lens of the game of Scrabble. And then um, in the second part of each episode, I take a, a question from a parent listener and, you know, do my best in a way that's not heavy handed to answer their questions about how I would best approach this problem. Mm. It's very unique because you get so personal in it. So uh, people are going to, especially if they have kids and a family, they're going to relate to you very well. Me and Matt, we're, we're, we're single, so we can't always relate to you on, on that level. But like I, I listen to it and I feel like I'm gaining knowledge for my, my future self. It's actually pretty, it's actually a very beautiful podcast, especially because I just like, I just like how so personal it is. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's just for parents. I think it's for people who appreciate a different point of view mm -hmm. and also people who like to laugh because I'm a, I'm a funny person. Like I like to interact. I like to make jokes. I like to, um, you know, encounter every realm of emotion that there is. And that's what the nurse papa podcast is all about. It's all, it's all about, you know, this very human experience of being a parent and kind of um, telling all about it and to being really, truly honest about the good parts, the bad parts, and the parts that people don't necessarily want to talk about. And I was, I was caught by your intro. Is that, is that your kid that's like in the intro or is that just like a random person that you're following? No, that's, that's my daughter. She is yeah. my co-host. Oh, that's awesome. That's uh, it. Yeah, no. Um, you know, as well, you guys don't know, I was going to say podcasting can get pretty lonely when you're doing it by yourself, but you guys are partners in crime. You know, for me, I, I don't interview people. I, you know, I tell these stories, but I really wanted my family to be part of it because it is their stories, right? I mean, it's, it's not just mine. So my daughter and my son and my wife are, are, are usually in every podcast. Um, and it's, it's pretty, pretty awesome. And I mean, you guys admit like hearing that cute little voice at the beginning of the podcast is a great way to uh, be led into a, you know, intense story, right? Yeah. And stories are you. like the strongest mm -hmm. way you could, you could spark learning. If you think about it, people have been telling stories for years and years and years since the beginning of time. And I feel like stories, well, in my opinion, stories educate me personally better than somebody just giving me a set of things to follow or like a program to say, you got to do this, this, and this. I prefer like a story to it because then, yeah. like I said, it's more personal and you could almost put yourself in those shoes. Oh, yeah. And that's how you communicate to kids too, right? Because mm -hmm. like they don't want to hear about what you think is right and wrong, but you tell them a parable about what happens that's right or wrong and they are so into that. Mm -hmm. How do you find like work-life balance? So I, I'm going to put work into everything that you're doing, book writing and all that, and even work. Do you have like a personal day for yourself once a week where you don't interact with, you know, maybe the wife for a couple hours and the kids, you go out doing your thing? You know, how do you find balance in this hectic life? Oh, I have no balance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard. it's hard, man, because, you know, we're, we're in a loud, noisy world, right? Oh, yeah. If I'm not, you know, if I'm not doing something personal, like, you know, my artwork or at, at home or taking care of my kids, I'm on, I'm on social media promoting what I'm doing. Like, it's really, really hard to find balance. Um, I am, I'm still struggling with that. I'm still struggling with having my phone in front of me and having it, having my phone out with, when I'm with my kids. Um, I think that it's, it's really about kind of not doing something sometimes which I'm still trying to figure out because I always want to be doing something because I'm, I'm an energetic person. I've got interests. You know, if I've, if I'm sitting on the couch, I just can't sit on the couch. I'm going to pull out my ukulele or I'm going to pull out my phone or I'm going to pull out a book. Like I just want to be doing something, but sometimes you need to find that space where you're not doing anything. And some, that's where some of the big realizations happen, right? Cause you're letting, you're letting the room happen for thought. Mm -hmm. you're, you're almost creating space between yourself and the thoughts just like you say i feel yeah. like that's almost like that eastern european mentality man where our gears are always grinding bro like honestly like uh being younger my dad taught me that work ethic you know it's like i was in nursing school i was working a freaking part-time job i was nursing and then out of school i was you know being a nurse i was trying this i was writing blogs it's like the gears are always grinding and sometimes that's exciting and that's where you find your balance too in a way you know it's like that beautiful art just like you mentioned yeah it's hard. I mean, I think it's all about the growth process and becoming 
a realized person. I am not a realized person, but at least I'm trying to be a realized person. It's a difference. <laughs> yeah. Well, the beauty, to, you got yeah. to be on the journey, right? Right. The beauty of it, like we're forever changing beings. You know, the person I was yesterday is different from the person I am today. I'm different from the person I'm going to be tomorrow. So yeah. That's just like such a wonderful concept that people kind of don't pay attention to it and, and they forget. We, we could change it instantly. We could, we could, if you don't like where you are today, you could, you could change it. If you don't like, you know, the way your, your, your thoughts are running, you could change them. It might take a little bit of time, but we're forever changing. And a lot of times people search for something and they never seem to find it. It's because they never, never find it because we're not meant to find th this thing. Like a lot of times you hear people say, oh, when I retire, I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to do that. But you're never going to be satisfied with life because we're forever changing. That's the kind of beauty of life within itself where you're always chasing something because you're never satisfied. Yeah, you know, you made me think about something. Mm -hmm. You guys, you guys bring up some good points. Thank you. Um, because it, it stimulates conversation in places where I did not think they were going to go. So as a, as a nurse, and you guys may relate to this on some level, I'll have a kid come in and I'll see what their disease is. And I'll absolutely know that this kid is going to be dead in a year. And like, what do you do with that? So at first, I, it just like destroyed me because like, how can you interact with this kid who's going to die? I had such a product, um, a, a product oriented relationship to nursing. How are we going to fix this? What are we going to do? And as I've become mature and grown as a, as a husband and a father and as a human, I've become much more process oriented. Um, and it's all about not what are we going to do? It's how, how are we going to do it? What kind of person am I going to be in this situation? What kind of human and am, am I going to be? How am I going to relate to this person? How am I going to make their life better in a way that doesn't preclude the fact that they're going to die? And it's really about how you do things and this process that you respect rather than depending on what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Yes, you're moving away <laughs> from, from how do we fix it into more of like this, this is the end goal. What can I do now to make the situation better, yeah. right? Because yes. there's a, yes. you can't fix everybody. <clears throat> You can't. No. That's the hardest thing for me was it was a nurse. It's just like me getting over the point in, in my head that says this person is going to die. Okay. I'm going to try and save him. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do my thing and he's going to be fine tomorrow. He's going to be fine. <sighs> he's going to come out of, he's not going to die. Super nurse. And you know, that takes a toll on you because you can't fix everything. You, you can't. And that's like the hardest barrier to get past as a nurse, because as a nurse, you want to be able to help. You want to be able to fix everything and you just can't. Right. Yeah. And you know, there's a chapter in my book, it's called, you can't fix everything. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that's, it's just the way it is. Right. 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 The, I want to ask you last question here. Why did you choose the word meditation for your book? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I was referring directly to like the, the act of meditating, but I was referring to the, the act of being present of, you know, that's when you, that's what you're doing when you're meditating, right? You are being completely present with your body with your surroundings. Um, and the idea that for me, parenthood is not avoiding mistakes because you're going to make a mistake every second. You're going to make a thousand mistakes in one day. Um, it's about being aware of what you're doing. It's about meditating on the fact that you are fallible and that you want to be better. Mm -hmm. I, there are so many moments when I just suck at parenting. I just, I just fail. I check out emotionally. I check out physically. I just don't want to be a parent because it's so hard. But I try to be aware of what I'm doing in that moment and realize what I have and realize what I can learn. And it's all about being present. That, that's, that's awesome. I agree with you, man. That's that's and that's all we have, right? Like um, just like we just to wrap up the podcast and all of our thoughts, it's like, you know, we're so fixated on death and dying. We're so fearful of that, right? Religion. We're just fixated on that future tense of dying. We have, I have to be a good person because I'm going to go to hell or heaven, right? And it's just all about here now. Like time and space technically isn't even, you know, doesn't exist that way. It's just this very moment. And, you know, that's like, I don't even know how to say it, but it's just that's the beauty of it, just mm -hmm. being present. Yeah. You know, and there's, you wrote one other question to me that, made me really think so i would love to address it mm -hmm. you um you asked like how does because it directly relates to this how you know through this journey of being a father how have i like determined how to make a like a fruitful present relationship with my kids and it just took me down the wormhole today trying to think about that 
And, you know, this morning was a mess. Like my kids were having tantrums. My wife was pissed at me. It was so hard to get my son out the door to go to daycare. And on the way, my car almost ran out of gas. I, I poured like an entire cup of coffee in my lap. Like I was just, I was a mess, guys. I was just like on the, the edge of losing it. And then I was, I chopped my son off at daycare and I was holding him. I was like just saying goodbye to him, hugging him. And my ear was pressed against his chest and I could hear his heartbeat. I could feel his heartbeat on my face. And it occurred to me in that moment that like these patients I take care of, I listen to their hearts and lungs all the time, every day. And I like intimately know what they sound like. I can hear the gurgles in their belly and I can hear the breaths in their stomach, in their, in their chest. But I don't do that with my kids. When's the last time did I listen to my kid's heartbeat? When's the last time I did a head to toe on my kid? And that moment, I was so like grateful for that presence of, of holding him and being aware of him and just like, you know, being a, a good dad. And the answer to that question of how do I develop a relationship with my kid is by just taking every moment for where it is, for what it is, and just being there. I mean, you know, you hear some people ask like, how do I develop a relationship with my 15 year old who doesn't want me around? The answer to that is like, don't wait until they're 15, do it when they're five. You gotta, you gotta just be in their face and just, and answer those really hard questions. Like I was sitting across the table from my daughter when she was three and she was like, you know, it was 5.30 in the morning, the coffee was still, still brewing, I was half asleep and she looked up and she said, Papa, are you gonna die? And I had no idea what to say. So I just said, yes, I'm gonna die. Uh, everybody dies. And she said, Papa, am I gonna die? I don't wanna die. And I, I was still honest with her. I said, sweetie, you're, you're gonna die too. Everybody dies, but it's not gonna be for a really long time. I hope. Eat your cereal. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, my daughter, when she asked me a question when she's 15, well, she, even now, she's she's probably not going to like what i have to say because it's going to be some variation of no you cannot do that <laughs> but she will know i'm being honest with her she'll she'll she will know that her father is always there for her and will always be honest with her and will always be there even when she's being an asshole i'm going to be there and sometimes i'm going to be the asshole that's just the way it is you just got to be there yeah, it's, it's the presence that you have and you bring to the table, you know, and just like you mentioned your story, like you explained your whole day, like we had no idea what happened to you, correct? But you're, you're in the present moment with us. You, those events that happened to you in the morning didn't dictate your mood, right? You're able to release all that energy, all that negativity, and you just grounded yourself and you're just here now and your energy level didn't change. And that's, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. I mean, you'll see if you guys are ever parents, like you just got to roll with the punches, like and hard morning does not mean a hard afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that my wife has taught me. Like, um, <laughs> you just got to shake it off sometimes. <laughs> like, it's going to be hard sometimes. But if you want to make it through the day, you got to shake it off. So one more question before we, you know, uh, head out. What's like some, something you've learned? Because you have two children now. Like yes. from having a first kid to now having a second kid. Is it true that the first kid is <clears throat> like the experimental child, you know, and then you learn, you learn from that one and you kind of, provide that knowledge and information to your next kid? Um, I don't know. I think it's different for every family. So yeah, you probably do learn a lot from your mistakes from your first kid and hopefully do not repeat them with your second child. But I think more so what happens is that you become more confident as a parent and a human mm -hmm. the longer you go and the more trauma that you are um, faced with as a parent because it's just like one traumatic event after another. Like whether it's like, you know, being woken up in the middle of the night or tripping on one of your kids fucking toys and, you know, twisting your ankle or like wondering, like, how many times am I going to stare at my kid's asshole? Because you like <laughs> just like constantly wiping your kid's butts until they're potty trained. I think you I, I've never thought about this way, but you're basically like you're in combat. You are just trying to make it through. You got your head down. You've got no you haven't slept for hours because you've just been getting pounded with artillery you know, your kids mm -hmm. and you just get good at it. And sometimes you get a little hardened, but like eventually you come, you come away from the war. You've got a little bit of PTSD, you know, mm -hmm. but like you're just better for it. Right. Cause you've, mm -hmm. you've been there, you've seen what happens. Mm -hmm. And then that, that second kid comes along and you're like, Oh yeah, no problem. I got this shit. 
<laughs> and then you go and fuck them up. <laughs> <laughs> Throw with the punches, man. <laughs> you got to roll with the punches, man. You're just going to fail. You're going to fail sometimes. You just got to roll with the punches. Yeah, I've been failing my whole life, you know. David, thank yeah. you for the thank you for um giving us the insight of what parenting is like and maybe those oh, yeah. that because we have a lot of listeners that are probably in nursing school and all that. So they're going to they're gonna find out what it is to have like kids, man. Where can we find you? Um, well, you can find me in Oakland, California. But if you want to find me on, <laughs> on the web, you um, so if you want to find out about my book, it's um, nursepopofthebook.com. I have a mailing list. Um, you can definitely sign up and you'll get updates about the podcast and the book, which will be coming out in August. I would love people to... Um, to find out about that. Um, my podcast, Nurse Papa, is on every podcast platform there is, and hopefully some that um, are not. And, um, you know, it's a really great way to learn about parenthood in a, a super not heavy-handed way. Um, on Twitter, I'm Nurse Papa. Instagram, I'm at Nurse Papa the Book. So that's that's pretty much it. And you can just call me. I can give them my number if you want. For sure, sure. Man. I mean, if you, if you want to be that balls, you can, but I'm not sure it's going to call you. No, don't, don't do that. No. <laughs> don't do that. But what I would um, love to tell your listeners, so are, are many of your listeners nursing students? Probably a wide range, mm. man. There's people that are probably mechanics <clears throat> that are fixing cars listening to us like that one guy. So it's a very broad range, but mostly. You've got like some cook in based. Antarctica who's just like, I can't wait to listen to a couple of nurses. <laughs> 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 yep. um, so what I will say is, you know, for all your nursing students out there, like, you just got to hold on. It's really hard being a student nurse and it's really hard to being a new nurse, but you've got resources. And if any of you are interested in pediatric oncology, do for sure reach out. I am happy to like interface with anybody who has questions about nursing, about pediatric oncology, about pediatrics for all you parents. Um, a big part of my show is like I talked about is writing this letter and me answering, you know, these really strange nurse, um, parenting questions. I would love, love, love to hear from any parents out there. You can write to David at nursepopofthebook.com and I will put you on my podcast, which um, I don't know if it's cool for you, but it is pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank sure. you, David. It's been a pleasure, man. Thanks, yeah, take it's been care. a real pleasure. I would love to talk to you guys again when the book comes out. Sounds good. August, right? That's the release date? August 17th, yeah. Let's do it. Have a good one, man. Okay. All right. Take it easy, Thanks, boss. guys.